honestly, it's just like, it makes back. sense because they're so loud. You can't hear yourself. I'm going to start whenever. What time yep. is it? You got three more minutes. Three more minutes? Three more minutes. How many of us are trumpet players? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, me. That's so exciting. How long has everyone been playing trumpet for? Hold up, hold up, hold up fingers. If you're, if you're, you've got, if it's like 15, you can do like one, five. Is that eight? Or is that 53 or 35? <laughs> five? 13? 13? Wow. I think I've been playing 20 years now. <sighs> I did the math the other day and I was like, wow. I'm like, that's more than half of my life. <laughs> Ooh. It's kind of crazy. And are you all here because of a marching band or just here because it's a cool place to be? It's a cool place to be. It's a cool place yeah. to be. I love it. That's so good. Did you hear the marching band? Did you, your ears bleed? No? Okay. Good. That's, that's a smart thinking right there. I know. I am probably gonna walk out with like five trumpets and be like, here, take my money. <laughs> and be like, I want this one and this one and this one. They're so, they, you guys do a really good job of Tempting us. That's the that's the goal. I know. I know. You guys are just too good at it. <laughs> My watch says that we have twenty seconds. So precise. Twenty seconds. I'm ready to go. I'll just bop here until. All right. Good enough. Are we ready to rumble? So, today I am going to be, I'm Kayla, Kayla Solomon, um, you can call me Kayla, I'm going to be talking about maximizing efficiency for your instrument. So this can be applied to any instrument, can be applied to trumpet playing, which is my instrument, which is this superior instrument, and <laughs> I'm sorry to the sax saxophonist in the room, <laughs> my apologies in advance, um, and today we're going to be talking about musicians' wellness body awareness and injury prevention. So my research in injury prevention um, focuses mainly on the embouchure, but it can be applied to like all parts of the body and all instruments as well. So the first thing I want you to think about is what is musician's wellness? If I kick my little thing, there we go. So first of all, in your mind, what, what does a healthy musician look like? How do you maintain your health? And how can that affect your experience as a musician? So I want you all to tell me, first question, what does a healthy musician look like? Or just a healthy person in general? What do you think? What about having like a good sleep schedule, right? Maintain, like making sure that you're not, you know, sleeping like three hours a night, maybe. You know, getting enough sleep. Um, eating healthy foods. Basic things that they teach us when we're little, it's like, eat your vegetables, eat your fruits, you know, all of those things help us to be healthy and help to keep our bodies healthy. And then maintaining your health, you know, making sure that you move your body, whether it's, you know, playing sports, whether it's going outside for a walk, whether it's making sure that you drink, you know, enough water every single day. Very basic things that our bodies need to function. And then, Maintaining this health, how can that affect your experience as a musician? Does anyone have any examples or any ideas? For me, as a performing musician, and especially, like, we don't work nine to five. Sometimes we have shows all night, right? So that makes it really hard to maintain a normal sleep schedule. So, like, let's say you wake up, and a lot of professional musicians, they teach. Maybe they'll teach throughout the day. Then they have rehearsals or gigs at night. Maybe they're getting home from a gig at 2 a.m. And then they have to wake up and they have to, you know, be somewhere for 8 a.m. So that really, makes it really, really difficult. So not only, like, do we need to worry about 
maintaining our physical health, but like our job actually makes it difficult for us to do that. And so that's what we're gonna be talking a lot about today. And as you can see, like maintaining health, it's not, not just your physical health. It's not just, you know, making sure that you can play your instrument. We're also talking about maintaining our mental health and our emotional health, social health, all of these things, which we are not gonna talk about today because then this would turn into a three hour lecture. But we are gonna primarily focus on physical health, the things that we need to do so that our body is going to function the best that it can. So then the other side of musicians wellness, so maintaining your health, overall health, then also as musicians, we can think of ourselves as athletes and we're striving for peak performance. We always want to be playing at our best and it's expected of us, right? You've got a concert coming up. You better be, you better know all of the notes, all of the rhythms, don't miss any notes, right? Everyone misses notes. So I want you to think about what a great performer looks like. Like name someone you've seen in a concert. Doesn't have to be a trumpet player. Throw out any names. Amazing performers. You don't even have to raise your hand. You can just shout it out. Yeah? Oh. Are you pointing? Dr. Ben. Dr. Ben. <laughs> Dr. Ben. Amazing performer. Okay. So achieving peak performance. There's, you can't see all of these fit people in the pictures behind here, but all of these people, amazing trumpet players and trombone, eh. <laughs> trumpet, mostly trumpet. <laughs> so how do you think these people go about preparing their playing for peak performance? You know, do you think that they wake up the day before performance and they're like, okay, time to get started? Probably not, no. So. When we're talking about musicians wellness, this is all a process. So we don't start the day before. We don't start the week before. We start months, sometimes years before the performance. And we are constantly working on going through this cycle of getting up to the point of peak performance and then coming down and giving ourselves a break. And then within that, we are also going through little waves of breaks and like hard focus time. And then the same thing, how can training peak performance affect your overall health as a musician. So if you're trying to, you know, get your endurance up for let's say, let's say marching band season is coming up and it's, it's summertime and you haven't really played at all, which is fine. You're allowed to take breaks, but marching band practice starts next week and you haven't played your trumpet or instrument barely all summer. And you're going into like what, how many hours of rehearsal? Eight? sometimes like 10, it absolutely blows my mind. But going into that, if you don't prepare your body, if you don't prepare your embouchure, right? Because these are really tiny little muscles. And it, if you go from doing absolutely nothing to doing a lot of something, there's a big chance that something could get injured along the way. And that's sort of what we're gonna be looking at today. And I know I talk a lot. So if anyone ever has any questions, you can shout it out, you can raise a hand, you can interrupt me, I don't care. So, musician's wellness, one hand is maintaining health, another hand is achieving peak performance. So we're trying to find a balance between the two. Then the other thing that comes into it is developing a healthy relationship with your instrument. And that's not only a healthy physical relationship, like, you know, making sure that your instrument fits well for your body you know violinists you know little little itty bitty violinists they'll start with like the tiny violin because their bodies are small but for brass instruments they're like here you go one size fits all but it's not it doesn't work that way so making the modifications that you need for your instrument so that it's easier for you to play because why would you want it to be hard why would you want trumpet playing to be difficult it's already hard enough you don't need to make it more difficult for yourself and we have the mental relationship which, how many of you have ever gotten mad at yourself while playing your instrument? Yep. Mm-hmm. So having that kind, that, that kind of relationship with your instrument, also emotional, right? We want to remain fairly neutral when we're playing because if you get really, really angry at yourself, your performance is going to go down. If you're completely like apathetic, if you just don't care, you're also not going to have the best performance. So. It's about training our bodies, training our minds, and achieving, like I said, that balance. 
which is hard. It is hard work, and it's like a constant struggle, and it's a process. So something to know, to remember about the balance is that everything is always shifting. Everything's always moving. One thing affects another thing. You're always going to have to recalibrate something. Um, and we will always have to make adjustments. And the other thing is balance will look different for everyone. Like for me, I might find balance in, you know, I need to get my like nine hours of sleep at night and I need to um, make sure that I always get a 30 minute warm up every day. But you might need seven hours of sleep at night and you might be able to like warm up in 10 minutes. Who knows? But like our bodies are different. Our life experiences are different. So our balance is all going to look different as well. And then the next thing that we're going to get into is efficiency. So being efficient helps us to maintain this balance. So what is efficiency? Basically work smarter, not harder. And as trumpet players, we really like to work harder, not smarter. So we got to switch that around. Um, the definition of efficiency, the ability to achieve an end goal with little to no waste, effort, or energy. So as you can see from the picture, we got the circle way easier to push than the cubes or the sphere. I guess you can't really tell it's not 3D, but we want to make things easier for us. So making things easier by having little adaptations to our instruments, making things easier by figuring out how our body works so that we can best use it to play the instrument as well. So within my research, I found three main factors that affect efficiency, especially on the trumpet. Um, first being equipment, second being time management, and the third being tension. So we're gonna, we're gonna break these down. Um, first off, equipment. So you think about a trumpet, you're like, what, you have a mouthpiece and you have a trumpet, what, what else is there? But there are so many things, and as trumpet nerds, we know. We know, I have probably 20 mouthpieces back in the hotel. Um, <laughs> I have two trumpets here with me and more trumpets back there. So for, for trumpets, like we talk a lot about mouthpieces, finding the right fit for you. And especially like if you're starting, if you start trumpet when you're what fifth grade, is that when we start here, you're gonna be changing equipment because your body's growing. Just like with the little violins, like as you grow, you're gonna get to the bigger full size violin. So with mouthpieces, it's really important to find a mouthpiece that fits for you. And then remember that there will always be change. Things will always be changing, and you have to trust yourself and your preparation, trust your embouchure, trust the air, that that's what's gonna make it work. The equipment is not gonna make, it's not, there's no magic, there's no magic equipment or magic mouthpiece that's gonna make you amazing at trumpet or any instrument. But we can use the equipment to help make it easier. So, this diagram we talk about finding an efficient mouthpiece. So first thing you want to do is you want to find a rim that feels the most comfortable. A lot of the time we end up choosing rims that are like, oh, all these orchestra players are playing on one and a half C. I need to have like a one and a half rim. No, you don't. Jens Lindemann plays on a seven C. That's what comes with the beginner trumpet case. Like it's all about what works best for you, what you're looking for. So finding a rim that's comfortable for you. If you're playing on a one and a half C and you're having trouble in your upper register, that makes sense. Get a small, get, get a smaller rim size. Go to a three C, go to a five C. I'm transitioning myself from a one and a half C because I grew up high, all of high school. I played a one and a half C and I just stuck with the same thing because that's what I was comfortable with. And I was like, I know it, so I'm gonna stick with it. But I've grown a lot height wise and just like face wise, like everything has changed in the last, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am. Um, <laughs> but so we always have these changes. Next thing, we're looking at cup size. So like if you are going more of an orchestral route and you want a deeper sound, you might go with a deeper cup. If you're playing commercial stuff, like what I'm doing this summer at Valley Fair, just check it out, it's super fun, um, <laughs> shameless plug, but that's more commercial playing. So I need to have more of a pop, more of a zing. So I'm looking for that kind of sound. So I'm going for a shallower cup. There's no cheater mouthpiece. You know, like someone's playing on like a really shallow cup and we're like, oh, that's a cheater mouthpiece. No, makes it easier for you. If it makes it easier for you, then absolutely go for it. Um, and then we deal, get more into resistance with like the backboard and the throat of the, uh, of the mouthpiece, which is something that you can talk to about with a mouthpiece professional, which I am not. 
but um, I did get all of this information from uh, Eric Mirren from Pickett and Blackburn. So um, that is where this information comes from, and this is my interpretation of that information. The use of practice mutes. We have tons of mutes. If you play with a practice mute all the time, when you take the practice mute out, your sound's gonna be different. It's gonna feel different, and it might feel wrong, too. So a lot of the time when we use practice mutes, all the time, we tend to overblow. We tend to force our sound because we have so much resistance that we're playing against. So those things can affect how we're playing. I have a student who's playing with a practice mute, and it just wasn't working. I'm like, play your harmon mute. Put your harmon mute in. Less resistance, it muffles the sound more um, than you know, like a straight mute will. But we want to find something where, that makes it easier to play. It's all about making it easier. We don't want it to be hard. We never want it to be hard. We've got tons of tools. Like, how many of you have heard of the PEAT, the personal embouchure drink something? Yeah, training, something. Exercises. training exercises thing. There's that which trains the embouchure muscles. So you can make your own. I, and I didn't bring my, I didn't bring my DIY PEAT equipment because it is in a storage locker right now. But if you have a button and a thread, you can put the button between your lips, basically, in front of your teeth, behind your lips, and you can pull the thread and just hold your embouchure, and that'll help to strengthen the muscles around here. And if you have any questions um, about embouchure exercises, I have a lot of those. I took them out of this slide because I didn't know how many trumpet players were gonna be in here and other, other instrumentalists, so. We love saxophone players. It's great. Welcome. Welcome to the game. <laughs> we also have the Ombo Shore, which Tom Hooten just came out with, which I do not have because I do not have that kind of money. But you can make your own DIY embouchure with a little bitty baby straw. You put it into the mouthpiece, you set it up, you blow a wind pattern, and then you have your embouchure set. And because you're starting with the wind pattern, you, your air is already pushing the lips forward. So when you take it out, your lips almost like naturally come forward into the mouthpiece. And like there's no forcing, there's no adjusting. And it's really awesome. Um, there's the visualizer, the breathing thing. There's so many little things. And one thing that I do want to talk about is the gapper. So I use a gapper, my third ring here. I had one here too, but I lost it. Um, <laughs> but... I was having a lot of problems. I was playing a piece that required me to play a lot of D flats and I couldn't reach. I'm gonna take this elastic off. And I couldn't reach. And any time that I would be pushing it out, I would actually be pulling up. So my slide would get stuck all the time. So by closing the gap with the gapper, I, thank you. <laughs> Can you tell that I work in entertainment? <laughs> um, it's much easier for me to move. And that's the thing, like when you get students, like their hands are not, not the same size as like the, the adult people who hold the trumpet. So making these tiny adjustments so that it's easier for them to play. Because like if you can't trigger to tune the note, you're gonna be lipping it and you're gonna get tired faster. So we wanna make, we wanna make everything so much easier on the trumpet because it's already so difficult. And then as we talked about like instrument sizes, adjustments, same thing, like we, the best example I have is for the violins because like they're made for different size people. And I wish that they did that for other instruments. I know for trombone, they have like the extend a bone, which is kind of, it's so cool. It's like a little extra like plastic part that like helps younger students get out to seventh position because they're tiny and they can't reach. So. I want you to take some time right now and reflect. You don't have to share if you don't want to, but I would love it if people would share and I can share my challenges that I've experienced. But what challenges have you encountered with your instrument? So I shared the one about my third slide. I'll share that one with you guys. Um, think about playing, like have you ever experienced pain from holding or playing your instrument? Sometimes people like, depending on if they hold if they hold their trumpet like this they're like oh my wrist hurts i'm like yeah yeah i, I bet it does so <laughs> you know think about holding your instrument think about playing your instrument are there any times where you feel uncomfortable where you feel pain or you know doing it for a really long time starts to hurt 
that's when we need to make some adjustments. Um, think of adaptations that have been made for your instruments. So like I said, with the gapper, with the extendable. And then what are adaptations that you would like to see for your instrument? Right? There are so many things that we can do to make playing easier. And like I said, it's not a cheat code. We're just, you know, if you can't see far, you get glasses to see far. I am blind. I wear contacts. <laughs> but like, we want to make things easy for us. We want things to be accessible for everybody. Um, and that's why we make these adaptations. So just keep that in mind as we go throughout. The next thing, the next big thing is time management. So a lot of younger students, me too, I was never taught how to practice. I'd be like, I started off playing piano. I would sit down at the piano. Four hours later, I'd be like, okay, I'm done. No breaks, nothing. Why do my arms hurt? I don't know. Silly, right? <laughs> so making sure that you're using your time efficiently. So not you're not only just using your body, your instrument efficiently, but you're using your time efficiently. A lot of the times, I mean, throughout college, walking through the practice rooms, you just hear somebody doing something, going over and over again, like cracking that top note and they crack it 10 times in a row. Like, that's not efficient practicing. You need to isolate what you're doing and figure out what's going wrong instead of just playing the mistake over and over and over again because then you're training that habit. If you played something incorrectly 10 times and you played it correctly once, what is your batting average? Not good, not good at all. So we wanna make sure that we're playing efficiently, we're approaching things logically and doing things in small chunks. Small chunks are the best way to do it. So this is a time-based practice plan. It does not work for me. I do not do well with a timer. I get so stressed out and I feel like I have to crush, crunch everything into that 15 minute time period or 20 or 10, whatever I set the timer for. So I use more of a skill-based practice session. So I'll write out a list of the, all the things that I want to accomplish. Let's say I have you know, some fundamentals, carbons, bark, all that stuff. And then I also have certain measures from a solo piece that I'm working on. And so instead of doing all of that all at once, what I like to do is I'll record myself playing small chunks and I'll listen back. So I'm resting as much as I'm playing. Or if I, you know, everyone can always work on their, you're training more, everyone can always work on their sight singing. That is a tricky, oh my goodness, don't even get me started on that one. But practicing for a little bit doesn't have to be a specific set of time. You can be like, okay, once I get through this exercise, I'm gonna go work on sight singing this page and cry a little bit. And then I'm gonna go back <laughs> to my practicing. So you're making, making sure that you're playing, taking your playing time and it's efficient. And then you're giving not only your chops a break, but you're giving your mind a break from you know just focusing so hard on that one thing. Um, and then, like I said about marching band, working up to heavier playing days. So just like a marathon runner, you know, if they're, if I'm running a whatever, 5K, whatever, tomorrow, I don't even think I could manage that. I'm not gonna start, like, I'm not just gonna wake up and run it. I'm, otherwise I won't be able to walk for a week. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm gradually working up to that, which is what we have to do with our playing. Because we are athletes, we use our bodies to play. Our bodies need to be in good condition to play. Um, and then mindful practice, like I said. So all of this stuff. And if anyone wants these slides, I can make them available. I also have an entire dissertation with all of this information in it that you will, that you can access <laughs> eventually. <laughs> so reflecting on our time management. So what does your typical practice session look like? Is are you the kind of person that goes? Uh, 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 uh. I'm that person. That's what I do. And it's so hard to not do that because that is like what I've done my entire life. So breaking that habit, and it's not really breaking a habit, you're just building a stronger habit on top of that and being mindful and being disciplined about it. How do you maximize your time to have an efficient practice session? Do you have your phone in the room? Do you check an Instagram? Check a TikTok? 
I am. I'm terrible at mindful practice. I have to quit. Do not disturb. Put the phone away somewhere else, right? What do you breaks look like? Like I said, are you on your phone? Being on your phone during your break is fine. Sometimes you need that mental break. How often do you like, just like, you know, stretch, move your body, be like, oh, I'm kind of, kind of feeling tight today. We have to move our body so that we can maintain that range of motion. The, the less you move, the less you'll be able to move. Um, and this brings us into ergonomics and other parts of your daily life. So how many of you have heard of ergonomics? Yeah, do you know what it means? No, same. <laughs> so ergonomics are basically making sure that our body is moving the way it's supposed to be. So you know when somebody tells, when you're lifting up something heavy and they're like, don't do it like that, right? We're not deadlifting, we gotta lift from here. So figuring out like the best way our body can work. Like another example that I have is if you're running and you decide to complete to run with like straight legs, like first of all, it's gonna hurt after a while. Second of all, you're not gonna run very far. That's not efficient. We run with bent legs and we, this, we have this motion because it is the most efficient for our body. And we don't often think about this when we're playing our instruments because we get into the habit of, okay, playing trumpet and there we go. I'm just gonna like, like I can still play. I can still play, I can still sound good, but I'm gonna get tired faster. And in the long run, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna be able to play as long. So we wanna make sure that, I don't break the TV stand. <laughs> we wanna make sure that we're using our body as efficiently as possible. So this ergonomic section I took out of Nancy Taylor's book, The Healthy Musician, which is fantastic, um, where she talks about posture, avoiding repeated twisting. So a lot of stuff where like, I mean, we don't do it a lot, but as music teachers or people like, you know, if we're moving books, moving stuff like that, the same motion without engaging the correct muscles, that can cause problems. Hunching, we all have that nice little, you know, it just, it just feels right, you know? We, it's like, oh, my body feels so relaxed. And then you try to straighten up and you're like, ow, now I'm in pain. So we wanna assess all of these things in our day-to-day -day life because that also affects our trumpet playing. And like I said, keep moving. One of my, one of my professors who taught a healthy music class, she said, motion is lotion. So we need, we need to have some, t some type of movement throughout our day that we're doing so that we can keep that range of motion. And then in order to have good ergonomics, we need to understand how the body works and how we can use it most efficiently. So we're gonna get into some anatomy next, which I love, and I'm gonna to try to make sure that I do not talk about this for too long because people are probably bored. So when we're training as athletes, we wanna train opposing muscles. So you know, you work out biceps, you gotta work out triceps, because otherwise you're gonna be unbalanced. Um, but your triceps are imbalances, and also overcompensation. So what happens when one muscle is stronger than another, it's going to take over and it's gonna do the work for that other muscle. So not only is that other muscle not going to be getting the, the workout that it needs, but the other muscle is going to be doing way too much and it's very likely that it's gonna get tired faster, tired or, or sore. How many of you, um, how many of you slouch? I slouch, everyone sits up straight, it's like, no I don't, yeah. Um, does anyone ever get pain like between their shoulder blades or like feel tight, you know? And this feels good for a moment, right? But what's actually happening is we are overstretching those muscles so they actually aren't working. When they're stretching, they're not working. So what we need to do to counteract that is we need to stretch these muscles because we're so far forward, these muscles are so tight. So they're pulling everything forward. So yes, everyone's like, okay, I had great posture. So good, po such good posture. So we want to fix those imbalances so that we can avoid the overcompensation because the back pain that most people experience, it actually comes from those muscles not being strong enough. So I'm gonna talk about a lot about this, how everything is connected. 
So tension in one area is gonna affect another. Same thing for playing trumpet. If you are tense up here, that's gonna come out in your sound. If your arms are tense, if you're like gripping the trumpet like that, it's gonna travel up, it's gonna come out in your sound. And also, we just, we just wanna be chill, we wanna be relaxed, right? Like I said, we want it to be easy, not hard. So our goal is to minimize tension. Less tension means less strain on the embouchure muscles. See how I'm tying back in there? And then we will always wanna find the most efficient body position so that we can minimize tension. And we talk a lot in um, athletics about stacking joints. So as you can see, this lovely person lunging, their joints are all stacked. So you wanna think about having you know, head over shoulders, shoulders over hips. If you were doing a lunge, you'd wanna make sure that you have those 90 degree angles. As soon as you, how many of you have done yoga before? I'm going to break this to you. I apologize. In yoga, teachers often talk about like making sure that your knees don't go over your toes because that puts it in a, in a position where it could get injured. You could hurt the joint. So we wanna make sure that, you know, we have those 90 degree angles that we're stacking those joints. So then we get to the spine, which is not clicking. There we go. So then we get to the spine. So our spine, lovely spine. It should have a natural curve. So when someone tells you to sit straight, your spine isn't like a broomstick. It's got this natural curve. And it's that way so that it can support our entire body. Something that is really, really interesting and scary is the more forward your head is, so you know, like from texting, from on the computer, I, all the time. I'm like, why does my neck hurt? Why does my back hurt? Oh, this is why. If your head is forward at a 15 degree angle, it adds 27 pounds that your neck is carrying. If it's at 30 degrees, that's 40 pounds. That is heavy. I mean, think about your neck holding an additional, like holding 40 pounds, like, that hurts just thinking about it. So we wanna make sure that we have these stacked joints where we want them. And then the exercise that you can do to like work on strengthening the muscles, so same thing, these muscles in the back, when we're, when we're sledge forward, they're stretched up, they're not working, they're not holding us up. So we need to strengthen those muscles by, I do, we do, we call it the double chin, like a little chin tuck. So you wanna think about driving your chin back See how I got a nice little double chin there? So that's what we want to get. And you just hold it for a few seconds, and then relax. And then do it a few times. This is something that's so easy to do. You can do it in, I do it in the car. Like I'm sitting in my car driving, sitting in traffic, not moving anyways, and I'm like, whoop, double chin, okay. Just like, you know, going back and forth. And that's strengthening those muscles. That's training those muscles that like, okay, wake up, you have to do a job. Because as of right now, they, they're like, ah, I'm on vacation. I don't have to work. And then you're wondering why your neck hurts, why your back hurts. So those are some things that you have to always think about. Also, making sure like the pelvis, I have the sits bones here. So like, you know, like the little, little bony butt that sticks down, that's what you're supposed to be sitting on when you're playing trumpet or when you're playing any instrument. As soon as you roll back into that really nice comfort, you know, like the recliner chair position, that's like feels so comfortable in the moment, your spine is going to be rounded at the back. And then everything's gonna be off balance. So it's all about making sure that everything is lined up so that we can make playing easier. Also make life easier. Why would you wanna have an, a sore back all the time? I don't. I don't want any of that. So we get into warming up the body before we play. We warm up our instruments, right? We're, so, we're, we're good about warming up our instruments, you know, play your long tones, play your scales. But how many of you actually like warm up your body? Do you like move around, do you do stretches, any of that? Nah, I didn't either. I still, I still struggle to do it. It's hard to add these habits into your life. But if you think about it, the more you do it, the easier it's gonna be to play easier it's going to be, to be to move, the easier it's going to be to get through your everyday life. So I want everyone to stand up. Yeah! So something that's so easy, like I'm not going to make you run laps, I'm not going to make you, you know, do crazy exercises, but I want you to just sort of like stand here and just twist. How does that feel in your spine? Like, does it feel tight? If it feels tight, maybe you should 
you know, try doing this a little bit more often. Think about what your core is doing to support you as you're moving. I'm just gonna keep doing this because I feel really, it's really, it's really nice. So, you know, warming up our body, making sure that our muscles are ready to move because we need to tell our body that it's time to, time to get work done. You can't just like roll out of bed and be like, okay, double C, you know? <laughs> I'm sure there are people that do that and I could never. The next thing that I want you to do is think about, so we're gonna think about our, our lovely little arched or hunched back. So uh, hold your hands like this, like you're holding ski poles or whatever. And then what I want you to do is you're gonna pull back and think about pinching your shoulder blades together. Almost like there's a pencil between your shoulder blades. Does everyone feel that? So that, yeah, that's an exercise that you can do to strengthen up the rhomboids. So easy. If you want it to be more difficult, I have some bands that I brought that will make it more difficult. But you can do this with a band. You can do this without a band. So you just hold it sort of shoulder, shoulder width apart, and then you pull out. Does anyone want to give it a try? Boys in the back? <laughs> you, you, want the, you want the easy one? <laughs> I tell the kids. You want the hardest one? <laughs> kind of you want to try? So this one's what, the equivalent of 50 pounds? But yeah, so, so we want to start sort of like right in front and then pull. You don't even have to like... You don't even have to do it much until you feel it. So working those muscles, doing that regularly. Now that, so as I mentioned, I work, I work at Valley Fair, I play five shows a day. I'm playing trumpet, I'm dancing, I'm moving. So I have to warm up my body because otherwise, like I said, I won't be able to walk the next day. So part of my, part of my warm up in the morning, I'm just like, just doing twists. I'm doing stuff like this. Also, you can do um, like, what is it, up dog, like when you're doing yoga so that you're extending your back, it's a cobra. I don't know, one of, anyways, one of those things. So what we wanna do is we wanna wake up these muscles. We wanna tell them, okay, it's time to work, and this is what you're supposed to be doing. We wanna tell, tell our muscles that this is what they're supposed to be doing because they're so used to doing stuff like this. The other thing that you can do, and that I, that I really like to do if you have a band with you, um, is, that, is shoulder mobility. Because as trumpet players, you know, we never really reach higher than this, right? But we want to maintain our ability to move. So if you hold it sort of like out to the side, kind of like a Y, I guess, if you were to lift it up in the air, and think about, as you raise it up, think about keeping those shoulder blades pinched. So you've got, thinking about locking them in, keeping them engaged, and then keeping them flat against your back as you're lifting up. And that takes, that takes some focus. And if you're, really, if you're really interested in checking out your shoulder mobility, you can do this with like a towel or with like a broomstick, but you can check to see if you have the mobility to go all the way around. The bands are easy, because like they, they'll stretch and they'll have give. But the whole time that we're doing this, we wanna make sure that we're keeping that pencil pinched and that we've got our core engaged. So you should really feel these muscles and these muscles working. Does anyone wanna try with the super heavy 50 pound one? Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> 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 do the 10 pound again. Do the 10 pound again. So, this is something that we talk about in like physical training uh, or personal training. We want to increase the heart rate to prepare the body to be like, okay, wake up, you have something to do. Um, and you can do this by like, you know, taking a walk before you start. It doesn't have to be crazy. You wanna activate the muscles. You wanna mobilize and find stability. So making sure that our, you know, our shoulder blades are like set in our back so we can play. The other thing about having good posture is having our heart open we want, our, we want to be as wide across the front as we are across the back. So this, obviously, this is a lot shorter. It also helps with breathing. We can expand our lungs more. And when we breathe, we can breathe into all directions because our lungs expand like 
like that. So we want to feel our lungs expanding front to back and side to side. So the IYTs that we did, or you can do like this lifting up, you can do Ys, or you can just do Ts, like that. And then if you really want to test your shoulder mobility, you can do the, the around the back one, which makes my shoulder go <laughs> <laughs> So getting into um, core muscles. So this is a lovely, our core. Everyone knows that these, these are the, the six pack, right? Six pack is the least important muscle. It is the most, so it's the, our six pack is like the one that's on the most outside part of our body. We've got like different layers of muscles. And that one we don't really use for anything important. The most important one is the deepest layer, the transverse abdominis. So that's the one that's like way in there and that's the one that's stabilizing everything that we do. So the core supports our spine and our posture. So we always need to make sure that we're using it and we're aware of what it's doing. Because a lot of the time, like we can, we can play notes, we can play trumpet without using the core at all. It's gonna sound tight, it's gonna sound squeezed. It's not gonna have the same resonance that you want as when you have a supported sound. So we're gonna get into strengthening the core. If you want, you can hand me the bands back. Oh, do we have all of them? Nice. So strengthening the core, and I'm not, you guys can sit down now if you want. <laughs> but see, getting, getting up, getting moving. That's what we want to do. We always want to be moving our bodies. I'm not going to make you do these exercises because it requires you to be on the floor. I can demonstrate them for you because I'm a trumpet player. I don't care. I spit on the floor or whatever. Um, so some of these exercises, well, first of all, does everyone, has, does everyone know like what engaging their core feels like for the most part? Okay, I want everyone to just like take a deep breath and give a put their put their hand on their stomach and give a cough like <laughs> there we go and now we're all sick just kidding but do you feel how your stomach there's like this little like movement that goes like Poof. this little jump and that's what we're engaging that's the core that's the core working it's like when you're sick and you cough a lot and you're like why is my why do my, why does my stomach hurt so much because you're using your core and those are the muscles that we're using to support our trumpet playing, to support our posture, to support everything. So some of my least favorite core exercises, the plank, I'm not even gonna demonstrate it because I hate it that much. But there are some exercises that you can do, like laying in bed, which is like, that's perfect. I, I, love, I love working out and not moving, right? Smarter, not harder. So we have the bird dog, which is on your, your hands and knees. And basically, this is something that you see in yoga a lot. So I'll show you guys here. But we want to have a flat back. We want our hands under our shoulders. Like I said, we want to be stacking those joints. So if I'm like this, that's not really stacked. And I don't know if people in the back can see what that's like. So when you're doing this exercise, you're going to extend opposite, and you want to remain as flat in the back and the hips, even as deep as possible. I'm not perfect. I'm gonna have, you know, I'm gonna have imbalances, I'm gonna have issues, but I'm working on it. Um, if this is too hard, you can do one limb at a time. And this is something that's super easy, and just this action, it gets you to engage your core. It wakes it up, it's like, okay, time to work today. The next thing you can do is the bear plank, which is like the plank, but not as awful. So you start the same as with the bird dog exercise, but then you lift your knees up. So you lift your knees off the ground, you just hold it, and then you know you cry a little bit, and then you're done. <laughs> but the next few, this one, you can do it in bed. You can do it laying on the couch. You can do it on the floor. Whatever. Like you lay on your back, you bring your knees to 90 degrees, you place your hands on your thighs. And basically, you're creating the resistance for yourself. So you're pushing your knees against your hands, you're pushing your hands against your knees. And that action, if anyone wants to try for free, that action here, you're gonna really feel it in your core. It's crazy how much of a workout that is. Like, I felt that so much more than even the bear plank that I did just now. And then another one, 
that's nice and easy that you can do, you know, lying on the couch, watching TV, whatever, the dead bug. So it's similar to the, the one that we just did, except it's kind of like a reverse bird dog. So you're gonna be extending backwards, opposite leg, opposite arm. So these are just like some exercises. There are a ton of exercises that you can do to wake up your body, engage your core before playing trumpet. Also like, you could just do this regularly during your day. You know, doing the, the tabletop one, or like where you're pushing against your legs, like just be like, oh, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and I don't feel like getting out of bed. Let's just do that a little bit. You know, 30 seconds. You worked out, good for you. <laughs> See, we, we don't wanna add too much to our schedules. We don't wanna make things harder for ourselves. I'm all about making sure that we're playing smarter, that we're adding these things to our schedules so that they're manageable because making complete life changes and practice changes is really hard. And it's, we can't sustain it because we're gonna go back into our old habits. Then we get into the muscles of the torso, which we talked about. So rhomboids, which is weak in basically everybody um, because of our you know, culture of like phones and slouching and forward. So you can always strengthen those muscles. And then the, the pecs and stuff, those are the ones that are often really, really, <laughs> really shortened due to um, due to the sledging. So those are the ones that we want to stretch out. So that's how we fix that imbalance and that overcompensation. So some exercises that we can do for strengthening these muscles, so especially strengthening the back muscles. So what we want to do, strengthen the back, stretch the front. Exactly what we did before with the bands, those you don't even need to do it with a band. I'm sure a lot of you felt it when we were doing it like that. Like, you don't need to do it with a band. If you're engaging those muscles and you feel it working and you're pinching the shoulder blades, you're working out. Congratulations, you worked out today. There's also, you can also do like external rotation. So as trumpet players, we need to strengthen like the muscles around our shoulders because you know we're up like this all the time. And if this part is like, or if our, our back is weak, so then we start lifting from here, and then this starts to get tight, and then it gets overworked. So we wanna make sure that we're balancing everything out. So we're, we're holding, we strengthen these muscles in the shoulders, but also in the back. So external rotation with these bands, or you know, a band you can do it with a cable at a gym, but just rotating like this, and making sure that your elbow stays at 90 degrees, and that your shoulder is in place. And then internal rotation is the other way. So you're, you're going this way versus this way. And then the last one, I think this is the last one, table pull. So at the gym or like with bands, you can like close it in a doorway, just pulling down, thinking about keeping those shoulder blades together and pulling back so that you're engaging all of those muscles in the back. And all the time when you're doing exercises like this, you want your core to be engaged as well because that will protect your spine. And we want that. So then we get to stretching. So how many of you have heard of static stretching or dynamic stretching? Yeah, do we know what static stretching is? Yeah, static stretching is basically, let's say I'm stretching my hamstring and I'm just like, I'm gonna be like this. I'm just gonna, just gonna stand here and it hurts <laughs> because I'm not flexible, but this is static stretching. A dynamic stretch is when there's movement involved. So like a stretch like this, you know, walking or swings, that's a dynamic stretch. So you know, you feel the pull a little bit and then it goes away. You like it when it goes away. <laughs> so before you play, before you do any type of exercise, we wanna do a dynamic stretch because it helps to wake up the muscles and it tells them, okay, we're actually gonna be doing work. As soon as you get into a static stretch, what happens is we have these awesome things called Golgi tendon organs, GTO, that, ha that are at the ends of our muscles, and they are like an on and off switch. So they regulate our muscle stiffness. So if we hold a stretch for 20 to 30 seconds, that GTO turns off, and our muscles, then, then we can stretch further, which is great. But then there's a bigger possibility that we can get injured 
because that reaction is gone. So like our muscles might start overstretching and then we overdo it and then we wake up the next day and be like, oh, that's a bad idea. So dynamics always first, static is at the end. Static, your muscles are already warm. They're already warm, they're ready to, you know, that's what the best time to do a static stretch is when they're already warm. And then as you can see, we have our bent arm wall stretch. So for all of us who are experiencing the tight pecs, tight chest, you can like find, find a wall and you can have your arm bent at oh, hello, <laughs> 90 degrees and just like lean forward and you'll feel that stretch all the way through here. And then you can adjust, you know, maybe, maybe you want to feel it further up, feel it like more in the armpit area, or if you want to have your arm down, like this. So like experiment with what feels good for you, because the more you stretch and the more you do it, I know I sound, you know, I'm a broken record, but it's going to feel better. Like every time, every day I'm like, oh, I don't feel like stretching. And then I do it, I'm like, oh, I feel better. It's like, yes, of course you do. So <laughs> do what makes your body feel good. Um, and there's, lot, there's a lot of other like, like heart opening exercises. Like you can put your, your hands behind, clasp your fingers, and then just like pull back. This is another one that I do a lot before I play in the park because I'm like this for 23 minutes straight, five times a day. And I can tell when I'm getting tired, I'm missing notes because I stop using this or I stop engaging from here. And I'm like, oh. Gotta get, gotta get back into that. So you do this one. Um, you can do yoga poses where like, you're, it's like the, the puppy dog, you can stretch like that. So you're really feeling that stretch in, in like the shoulders as well. The next thing we're gonna talk about is probably one of my favorite things that I just learned about. Um, I shadowed at a physical therapy clinic for a month and we worked a lot with like people recovering from uh, hip replacements, knee replacements, you know, all the things you guys don't have to worry about, thankfully. <laughs> um, but nerve glides are something that I just discovered. And basically what happens in our body is if we don't move, our nerves can kind of get stuck. So like, you know, when you have a pinched nerve, like you sleep wrong and like you wake up and you're like, oh, you know, I can't, can't move my head, something like that. That can happen to a lot of our nerves, like in our body, especially up here because we've got we have three main nerves that come down our arms and what we need to do to relieve the tension is something called a nerve glide so or nerve flossing and basically it's just a motion that gets your nerves to move back and forth sort of it's just like you're you're ironing out the wrinkles so it's a continuous movement it might be uncomfortable but it should not be painful like if you get like a zap pain that that is not good but some of the ones that we do, that I like to do for my arms, if you just, uh, everyone stand up again. I'm making you do all of this stuff, okay. So, hands just regularly at the side. Now I want you to turn your palms forward. And I want you to flex your wrists back. Don't feel that, sort of up your arm. And then what I want you to do, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do the right arm first. So, we're going to lift our arm up to the side. Flat, now flex, feel little tingles, yeah. Okay, and now move back. So you wanna move in and out of this position. This isn't like a stretch that you hold for 20 seconds. You like feel the tingle and then you release it. And then what you can do is if, you're feel, if you feel like you can do it and like everyone's different, like I said, everyone's completely different. For this one, what you can do is you can move it up like this, like you're holding like a little server tray with like cheese. I love cheese. And then turn towards you and just be really aware of what you're feeling in your body. If it hurts, stop. And then towards your face. And if you feel that, so this, this, this one's one of my favorite ones because it's just like, it's like this one. So like, if you can do that, that's a nerve glide. <laughs> exactly. But basically, so you wanna, you wanna go into the point of uncomfortableness and then come out. So we're gliding, we're basically like massaging the nerve because it gets stuck in the tissues and stuff and we need to re, like, recreate that path for it. Okay, let's do the other side since we need to keep it up. So we're gonna start, let's flex that left hand back. Okay, we feel that, awesome. Let's lift it up to the side. 
Let's do a little bit of a stretch. Ooh, this one's worse. <laughs> this one's worse for me. Okay. Do a few motions in and out. Yeah, you feel that. And then let's lift our cheese platter. And it's crazy. Like, this is just like simple movement, right? Okay, now let's turn towards us. This is where it starts to hurt for me. Not like hurt, hurt, but this is where it starts to feel really a little bit more uncomfortable. So we're moving out. And then do our little, little eye thing. <laughs> so these are things you can do. There's tons of stuff on nerve flossing, like online. Also, um, there's a handout that I asked the, my physical therapist that I was shadowing to send me, but she hasn't. But if you want it, I will, ha I will send it out. Um, but yeah, nerve glides are something that I just learned about and I'm like, wow, this makes so much sense. If you ever get tingling in your arms like when you're sleeping at night, you probably should do some nerve glides. And there are different nerve glides for each nerve. So this picture, it shows you like, you can do, there's, there's stuff for like the sciatic. Like if you have sciatic problems, like doing this and then like just moving, moving in and out of those positions and like iron, ironing out the kink. Um, so this sort of gets us into the things that you can do away from your instrument, and I am probably gonna, I'm probably gonna wrap up soon. I have like, I have three slides. We'll be fast. So things you can do away from your instrument: massage. I really like. So I have a very tight jaw. I clench my teeth at night, and I have uh, ripped through retainers before. So <laughs> that's lots of tension in the jaw. But like massaging the muscles of your jaw like if you just like run your fingers up you feel the little bumpies you know we all have them little knots there once you find one just apply pressure like pressure that you can manage it's not like painful painful pressure for like 10 seconds and then you can release it but the same thing like you can get find like a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball and you can you can massage out these muscles here the pectorals um, basically anything. Massage is going to help with recovery. It's going to help you feel better. We want to feel better. We want to want to play trumpet easier. It's all about, you know, making our body happy. You can do foam rolling. These are some exercises. I just found this literally in Google Images. Exercises for foam rollers that you can use. I use a jade roller on my face and I'll like roll out my jaw because my jaw is nasty tight. And then we also talked about stretching it. These are all things that you can do that'll make your playing better that don't involve actually playing your instrument. Because if our body is, is in good working condition, then it's gonna be way easier for us to play. Um, and then like I said, everything's different between people. You can all sit down, I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like I'm in church, okay. <laughs> um, when we're working, when we're training, when we're practicing, so getting back into like the actual practicing part, we want to manipulate the different variables and it's going to be different for everybody. So you want to train opposing skills. If you were playing super loud one day, maybe next day, challenge yourself to play really soft. I do a lot of loud playing every day, so my warm up and my warm down is like playing whisper tones as much as I can. So we want to balance that out. And you want to vary your training from day to day. If you get into a routine and it's like you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again, not only are you not pushing yourself to get better, you know, at the things that you find challenging, your body's also not getting the variety that it needs. And then also incorporating warm up and cool down. We do warm up, but we don't always do cool down. And I am guilty of that too. I don't, I don't like doing cool down. I'm done for the day. I'm like sleep, you know, but it's really important to, you know, play those pedal notes, play those long tones, just do some really light playing at the end of the day to help your body sort of reset. It's like doing the static stretching after a workout. And then we also talked about mindful practice. And then my last slide. So these are musician friendly resources. A lot of the times if you, if you have a problem and you go see a doctor, they're gonna be like, well, stop playing your instrument. And I'm like, cool, I have invested uh, this much money and this many years into becoming a professional trumpet player. I can't, I can't stop playing my instrument. So these are organizations, medical practitioners, musicians who are familiar with performing arts health and medicine and will help you. And this is, if you want to take a picture, if you want to take a screenshot, whatever, this is, uh, also something that I'll make accessible to everybody. But 
like I said, it's all about playing smarter, not harder, and doing things for your body that makes it feel better. We have questions? I know I talk a lot. I'm sorry, I like talking. You guys have any questions for, uh, for Dr. Kate as well? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kayla. Really appreciate your time.